Jason Clare, welcome to the program. Good day, mate. So, when you look at the list of recommendations in this report, what do you believe are the most important and what are you willing to adopt? Well, I think I've made it pretty clear that my priority is helping more kids from the outer suburbs and the regions, more kids from poor families get a crack at university. Uh, at the moment, about one in two kids in their 20s and 30s have got a university degree, uh, but not in my neck of the woods, not where I grew up, and not in the regions. You know, what this report says, Dave, is that we've got to boost the number of, of people with either a TAFE qualification or a uni degree to 80% by the middle of the century. Think back about, you know, into the 1980s, look at what Bob Hawke and Paul Keating did. They boosted the number of kids finishing high school from 40% to almost 80% includes you and me, a lot of people watching the program. That's nation-changing stuff. What this report says that by the middle of the century, we need a workforce where people haven't just finished high school. 80% of people haven't just finished high school, but they've gone to TAFE or university as well. And that's no easy task. And what the report says is if we're going to do this, and we've got to do it, otherwise you've got an economy with a handbrake on. If we're going to do this, then you need to break that artificial barrier between TAFE and uni, make it easier for people to move between the two, and we've got to get rid of that invisible barrier that stops a lot of young people from poor families, from the regions and from the outer suburbs of our big cities from getting a crack at uni in the first place. So looking at some of those barriers, uh, as, as you call them, the report says one is the cost of living while you're studying. You need to increase financial supports for a lot of these kids, expand access to youth allowance, um, make some sort of payment available for those who have to do pra practical uh, placements in schools yeah. and hospitals. Are you willing to do those sorts of things? We've already done a bit of it. In the, in the budget last year, we increased youth allowance and Oz study. Uh, it talks in this report about extra changes that could be made there. It also recommends ideas like a jobs broker. So while you're at university, getting the chance to be paid to work part-time in an area that you're studying in. You know, I spent a fair amount of time while I was at university cooking cheese toast at Sizzler rather than in the <laughs> area that I ended up working in or mm. the area where I was studying in as a law degree. So it says that's an area where you can help people with the cost of living. And you're right, on paid prac, it makes the point, if you're a nursing student, you know, you're spending 800 hours working in a hospital where you're not paid. If you're a teaching student, about 600 hours through the course of your degree in the classroom where you're not paid. Often you've got to move to do the paid prac. Often you've got to give mm. up your part-time job. And so, you know, I've spoken to teaching students and nursing students who've, who've told me that they can't afford to do that. They've done the theory, but they can't afford to do the prac, so they drop out. Well, they end up sleeping in a car because they can't afford to pay the rent or to pay the bills. So it's recommending there that governments invest in paid prac for teaching students and for nursing students and work with industry on providing more support for work integrated learning in other areas. So what are you, are you going to do it? Are you the minister? Are you going to give them some sort of payment? Well, we're not responding to the report today, but it strikes me as, as the sort of area where governments need mm. to work together on this because it can be the difference between whether students finish their degree or not. In teaching, for example, only about 54% of teaching students who start a degree finish it. The average across university is 70%. Now, we've got a, you know, we've got a, a teacher shortage crisis in this country. If we could increase the proportion of teaching students who finish their degree, we would go part of the way to tackling that crisis. Talking about uh, teaching courses, uh, they did become cheaper uh, under the Morrison government's Jobs Ready Graduates program, along with a bunch of other courses trying to get more kids into them. But uh, arts, humanities, law degrees uh, became a lot more expensive. The report recommends ditching that yeah. scheme. Will you ditch it? Well, if the purpose was to reduce the number of students doing arts degrees, it didn't work. I think Raf made the point a minute ago. Uh, with the more people studied arts degrees after this change came <laughs> into place than before it. Um, you know, it's, it, I guess, a, a classic example that people pick the subjects they do at university based on what they love, what they want to do, the profession they want to go in, rather than that deferred hex payment. Making changes here is costly and, 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 and difficult. I think Raf also mentioned this tertiary education commission, which mm. would look at how you'd move to a new funding model it strikes me that's the sort of thing that they would have to look at and how you would make that change. So that might take some time, setting up the commission first before you then change the course fee structure. Yeah, we've got to make a decision if we set the commission up or not, but it strikes me as a good recommendation. It's the sort of thing that helps to make sure you build long sustained reform. Remember, mm. this is a blueprint not for the next couple of years, but for the next two decades. Over that time, there'll be plenty of different ministers, plenty of different governments, even different vice-chancellors. 
And, and what, what, what we've been proposed to us here is a commission that can help to drive and sustain reform in higher education over those two decades. What, just on that, how would that work? Would that commission allocate funding to different universities? Potentially, yeah. There's different models uh, that have been suggested. The report also recommends that if we go down this path, we set up an implementation advisory committee to look at the detailed structure of it mm. and make sure that we'd get the legislation that would underpin it right. Um, but the report makes the point that all universities pretty much look the same at the moment, roughly the same number of students teaching the same sort of subjects, and says we'd benefit from a bit more diversity. Different universities doing different, doing different things, mm. some bigger, some smaller, making sure that we've got universities where they're needed. You know, when I grew up, there was no university near me. Uh, you had to head a long way to get to university, and it meant for a lot of kids in my classroom, they felt university was somewhere else for someone else. I want to make sure that we make mm. it easier for, for, for kids growing up in our outer suburbs and the regions to get a crack at university, and that's, that's part of what this commission can do. You mentioned the hex debts or the help debts that uh, um, particularly low-income graduates are absolutely struggling with. The report talks about this, makes a bunch of different recommendations. Can you give people any hope that they are going to get an easier go when it comes to their student debts? You know, it's got recommendations around indexation, but also how you could potentially reduce HEX payments. The, the report says we've got to make HEX simpler and fairer. You know, it says HEX is a good system. HEX blew the doors of universities open uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. When, when Hawke and Keating introduced HEX with, with John Dawkins, there was only about 5% of the Australian workforce had a uni degree. Now it's more than, than 26%. But this report says we've got to make it fairer and simpler. And uh, Bruce Chapman, the, the architect of HEX, has helped the panel with a recommendation that says that there are ways to reduce upfront payments for people on low incomes. So, for example, uh, if we were to go down this path, it says that someone on an income of $75,000 a year would pay every year about $1,000 less. So that's something that could provide an immediate cost of living benefit for people after they finish uni and they're in the workforce with cost of living on top of the tax cuts that we've introduced and that will hopefully go through the Senate this week. So what you're flagging there about a $1,000 benefit for someone on 75 grand, is that something we might see in the budget? Well, we have to go through the whole plan over the next few months. We'll respond to the accord over the course of the next few months. Can't do all of this. Don't have to do all of this right away. This is bigger than one mm. budget, but we do need to get started now to build the foundations for long-term reform and we'll respond on that recommendation on, and on all the others. I mean, the other recommendation, we, you hear a lot of um, people complaining about this, is the timing of indexation. So they'll make their payments, paying off their student debt all year, but then they get the indexation kick in that covers the stuff they've already paid off all year. It's a, a, a double hit. Can you mm. fix that up? Well, that's one of the things that we asked the Accord to look at. They've given us a recommendation about that. They've also given us a recommendation about how you index HEX, or what is now called HELP, uh, and recommending that it be set according to the wage price index rather mm. than CPI. So on all of those recommendations, we'll look at those and cost those and prioritise what we do first uh, in our response that we'll put out in the next few months. In the next few months. So there will be something in the budget. Well, I hope so. I've got to go through the ERC mm. process, not the ABC process today. <laughs> okay, well, I'll persist. Uh, on the cost, I mean, as you say, some of this is longer term, but do you have any idea what sort of price tag implementing this accord uh, would carry and how willing are you to actually stump up and, and make these changes? Well, mate, I'm determined to drive reform in higher education, but also in school education and early education. This is all connected. You know, we're not going to be successful in what this report tells us we need to do in, in hitting that 80% target if we just rely on reforms that start at the university gate. You made the point in your intro that not enough young people are finishing high school. Over the last five or six years, we've seen a decline in the number of people finishing high school, particularly at public schools and particularly young people from poorer backgrounds. They're the same kids that are more likely to fall behind at primary school. They're the same kids that are less likely to go to early education. This is all connected. And so we need reform in early education, in school education and in higher education if we're going to hit these targets and build a better and a fairer education system. There, there, there is one recommendation in this report for how you'd find some additional money uh, to do some of these things. This is the Higher Education yeah. Future Fund where you'd have contributions from higher performing universities 
creating a $10 billion fund uh, with an asset, uh, with an income stream then to, to help some of those who are struggling. Look, um, as you would have seen, the Sydney University Vice-Chancellor Mark Scott says it's a tax dressed up as a fund. Are you going to go down this path? Mate, I've got an open mind. As you say, there are some universities who hate it. There are other universities who, who love it. You know, what this is, is a fund where the Commonwealth would chip in money, where taxpayers chip in money, but also unis chip in money as well to invest in things like affordable student accommodation and research facilities, classrooms for universities. I think where we all agree is we need more affordable student accommodation. Mm. So whether this is the way to do it or, or, or some other way, I'm keen over the next few weeks and months to talk to universities and others about th whether this is the way to do it. One of the other concerns on this one uh, from the Deakin University Vice-Chancellor is that you'd see philanthropic donations dry up. I mean, if, if someone makes a bequest to a particular university, they don't necessarily yeah. want that hived off to, a, to another university, do they? No, no. And so that goes to the detailed design. If you went down the path of setting up a fund like this, you'd want to protect that. If you want to encourage philanthropic donations, as you would rightly expect, people want that money spent on certain things. So you wouldn't touch that? Well, I don't think so. You know, it, it might be, you know, if you went down the path of setting up a fund like this, people may want to put donations into it. But that's all mm. for detailed mm. design if we choose to set up a fund like this. Now, on school funding, and you, you drew the link earlier between the, the need to really lift those uh, high school retainment rates before you can really get more yeah. people into university and vocational education. It's part <clears> of the problem here that public schools just aren't funded enough. Well, they're not fully funded. They're not fully funded under that Gonski model. No public school in the country is, except for where you are at the moment in the ACT. Non-government schools are, government schools aren't. At the moment, the states are legally obliged to, to fund up to 75% of what's needed for a public school, and the state, uh, sorry, and the Commonwealth government is obliged to put in 20%. That leaves a 5% gap. And so the negotiations we're having now are about how we fill that gap. What the, the Commonwealth government chips in and what the states chip in, and importantly, what we use that money for. You know, what we tie that money to to make it work, make sure that we invest mm. that money in the sort of things that are going to help to make sure more kids do finish school. And a big part of that is going right back to the start, identifying kids that are falling behind early and intervening early with things like catch-up tutoring, investing in the things that are going to help kids who fall behind to catch up and keep up and finish school. Well, you have done a deal with WA uh, for a 2.5% increase. The other states say that's not enough. They want you to cover that full 5% gap you just talked about there. Are you willing to do that, go that far? Oh, I won't go into the negotiations that we're having with the states, but you're right, we've, we've signed a statement of intent with WA. It means an investment of an extra $700-odd million over the next five years by the Commonwealth. It'll mean that the most disadvantaged schools, public schools in WA, are fully funded from the start of next year. Mm. But you're willing to go and beyond that, all, that for the other states? And, 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 and that all public schools in WA are fully funded by 2026. But I want to do a deal with every state and territory to get every public school in the country mm. up to that full funding level and make sure that we tie the money to the things that, that we know work to tackle the sort of problems that exist at the moment, Dave. If you're... Just, just to make this point, because this is important and it goes to the Uni Accord report as well. One in three kids from poor families fall behind the minimum standard that we expect in primary school at the moment. And only one in five of those kids catch up by the time they're in high school. That's a big part of the reason why we're now seeing a decline in the number of kids from poor families and public schools finishing high school. You We've got to fix that if yeah. we're going to fix these, these challenges Understand. in this report. You mentioned tying the funding to what's happening in the classroom. Can I ask you, there's a concern, <clears throat> and Labor used to raise this concern in opposition, that under the current arrangements, the states can use, I think it's 4%, up to 4% of, of their contributions to the public mm. schools for things that aren't necessarily directly related to the classroom. Um, buses for kids to get to school, teacher um, uh, accreditation courses, registration bodies, capital depreciation costs. Can you yeah. close that loophole? Labor did talk before the election about closing it. It's the sort of thing, Dave, that I would expect would be part of the negotiations with right. the states and territories, which we've now kicked off. I think the point I'd make to you... You want them to close is that, is, is, Well, the point I'd make is I want taxpayers' money to glow in the dark. I want parents and teachers to know where the money is going, whether it's in a public school or whether it's in a non-government school. That's mm. the key here. We okay. don't have enough information on that at the moment.
Final one, Minister, we, we mentioned the infrastructure issue for public schools, the Australian Education Union on Friday really ramping up the pressure, yep. pointing out uh, you know, how, how the top private schools are spending uh, so much more than the bulk of public schools, five private schools spending more on lavish facilities than more than 3,000 public schools. Yes, that's to do with the fees they charge, but for your part, the Commonwealth does provide uh, $1 billion, I think it is, in capital funding for private schools over four years. Mm -hmm. um, but for public schools, not a cent unless you extend the one-year program. Um, will you do that? Well, we're rolling that out, out now. Um, you know, I, most, most non-government schools are low-fee paying schools, yep. David. There, there, there are a bunch where you know, it costs a king's ransom to go there and they look more like a place where a yep. king would live. But most are, <laughs> are low-fee paying schools. I, I'm not trying to break the Gonski model. I want to finish it. I want to make sure that we fund our public schools properly. I'm a product of public education and damn proud of it. And I want to make sure that we, we close that funding gap and close the education gap. There's a lot at stake here. I've got to introduce legislation at the end of the year to increase funding for public schools. London to a brick, the Liberal Party will vote against it. And if they win the election next year, they'll rip that up. And if you doubt me, look at what they did last time. So the agreement I strike this year and the election that we fight next year will determine the future of public education in this country, not just for the next few years, but for decades ahead, whether we build a better and a fairer education system or not. You're expecting an election next year? I think so. <laughs> OK. Jason Clare, Education Minister, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Appreciate it. Good on you. Thanks, mate.